So, Jackie, it's another day. More revelations in the Telegraph, thanks mm -hmm. to Isabel Oakshot and uh, the WhatsApps that she has released. And, and she's sort of... Obviously, the big question is, there's been a betrayal along the way. Was it the government betraying the great British public over what happened in lockdown? Mm -hmm. Was it the journalist betraying the politician that she'd agreed to write uh, a book for at the same time? What's your take on that? It's difficult to know which side to take here, isn't it? Um, ben, was it Henry Kissinger that said about the Iraq-Iran war, it's, you sort of hope neither of them can win? The problem, <laughs> with, the problem with this is there is a public inquiry. I mean, in one way, I can understand Isabel Oakeshott's frustration about mm. how long mm. it's going to take for, the, for that to go through its process. Which she said was her motivation for leasing the WhatsApp. She felt like, you know, that was going to take forever. Do we believe that? Of... I don't. Um, she's, you know, she's been... She has a particular political position with respect to the lockdown, which mm -hmm. is legitimate. But given that, you wonder why Matt Hancock trusted her with all of the information mm -hmm. that he did. And secondly, I think you need to aim off because of that particular position that she, that she takes. If she was, you know, uh, I think Matt Hancock, and I think I said at the time, was ill-advised to do the book in the way in which he did. I think he should have allowed the public inquiry to find the truth and to determine responsibility and what should have happened mm. differently and I and I hope that we can now focus on that because I don't think this sort of battle between supposed journalist and former minister is particularly um, enlightening and it certainly doesn't help those who suffered throughout the pandemic who no, want to know no, the truth. But I that. suppose one of the questions might be as well is that when you see how much revelation is on these WhatsApp exchanges, which, of course, aren't subject to the Freedom of Information Act, it sort of makes you aren't think, they? well, apparently not. Yeah. That's what we were told yeah, yesterday. Yeah, because they're WhatsApps and they're encrypted. Uh, it, it's encrypted, so it's a different thing. But, you know, it makes you feel like that there, there's an awful lot of government going on that we can never access. Now, of course, that's no surprise. But... It does feel pretty mm. visceral, some mm. of the yeah. tone of these, doesn't it, Cindy? Totally agree. Um, and <clears throat> bear in mind how new WhatsApp is when it mm. comes to government business. You know, FOIs are here so that we can see post facto. If we need to see some of this stuff, we can request it and it will be all in the public eye. As you say, you know, this kind of new uh, communication form, we haven't allowed for that kind of stuff. Mm. And if you look at these messages, so much governance is taking place mm. there and so much governance on the hoof as well. Yeah. So mm. it'll be stuff like whether or not to loosen up to non-necessary uh, uh, non retail. And it'll just be Matt Hancock saying, well, you know, the public aren't with you on that one and therefore Boris Johnson backing down. It's like, that's not scientific. Mm. Mm. You know, there's a lot of um, the Conservative government literally using polling data mm. to determine public health strategy. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's literally the definition of populism in some ways. But, you know, they were literally talking about schools being closed for months on end because the public wasn't mentally ready for it. At the same time as Matt Hancock saying, we need to have a public health campaign mm. to make sure that the public are more scared of this virus. I, you I, know, all of this stuff coming together is really an edifying for the government. I think Cindy makes a really important point about the nature of government and WhatsApp. And, there, and there's two things about that. Firstly, I mean, I feel a bit old school. We didn't have WhatsApp in my day. No. Um, <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> you know, they used to bring in a slate with a bit of advice on it and we'd sit around. Chisel it. But, <laughs> but seriously, you... Um, there was something about the first set of, of WhatsApps where the Prime Minister is saying, what's this mortality figure? And the scientific advisers are, 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 are trying to explain to him and then somebody's throwing in a bit of polling data. I mean, it feels as if actually, and as I say, I am old school, wouldn't it be better if people sat down with the information around a table, uh, considered it in a sort of um, measured way, took a decision and had that recorded. Was one was of the issues they were isolating, yeah. though, Jackie? Yeah. They couldn't all be together? Well, I mean, it was, yeah, we were in the I middle of... I remember we were doing quite a lot of Zoom meetings at yeah. the time. I mean, but yes, right. of course, there's always meetings. Right. Oh, yeah, exactly. Of course I get that. And, and, you know, let's not forget that this was an enormously difficult mm. time when people were making decisions. But I, it doesn't feel yeah. like that's a good way of... of let's look no, at some I mean, of the... there's always been conversations, though. You must have done that, Jackie, despite being from the Stone Age like myself. <laughs> um, you must have had moments where you've wanted... Uh, there's a former 
a meeting with lots of people there and with somebody that you trust, you wanted to go, hang on a minute, are we doing the right thing on this here? And I guess the problem with this is things always look different when they're written down in yeah. print. And so what might be a conversation in the loose mm -hmm. or the corridor where you're exchanging it? And what, what, what I think is unsettling well, is the tone exactly. of some of these. And one of the things that struck me, uh, I'm just looking for it now quickly, is uh, one of the comments, uh, Simon Case and Man Hancock talking about the quarantine hotels. So these are the ones that were released today. These are the, these most are the recent new ones. These are new ones. ones Talking on WhatsApp about that because, and this is one of the things that caused the public a lot of concern, didn't it? The, the cost of staying in the hotels, uh, whether to go away or not, and if you did, t taking the hit, as it were, of being locked in the hotels. So Simon Case says, any idea how many people we locked up in hotels yesterday? Matt Hancock says, none, but 149 chose to enter the country and are now in quarantine hotels due to their own free will. Simon Case says, hilarious. I know. I mean... That's a shocker. On every level, <laughs> it's terribly... But then... And the, the people coming in, some of them may have chosen to, but some of them might not have been able to make that choice. Mm. They had to mm -hmm. come in for family mm -hmm. reasons, for work reasons, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. There's mm -hmm. another one that comes in. Uh, this is Matt Hancock talking to, with Boris Johnson, a quarantine text. This is Matt Hancock with a link to a Sky News article. A man and woman have been fined £10,000 each for failing to uh, quarantine after returning from Dubai, police have said. Boris Johnson's response, superb. I mean, these are... The, 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 it's the, as cases, the tone, Jackie... The, Nobody the would... Now, the he might have meant superb because they were at the time, and this is also featured trying to haul in police officers, which is quite mm. shocking to say, yeah. you must enforce this more, because there was criticism not enforcing. He might have been saying superb that, that the policy had worked, but it looks like yeah. he is happy about He's people being about fine, and you know? And that Partygate is going on, let's bear in mind. Well, totally. quite. <laughs> None of us would want to... You know, I certainly wouldn't want everything I ever said whilst I was a minister to become yes. public. I was... I once got an award for being the minister most likely to swear in a, <laughs> in a meeting. <laughs> However, um, I don't think I ever called police officers plod. I never said that teachers were work shy. And I never worked with a senior civil servant who would say hilarious mm. about something mm. like that. So I just think it's... Um, it, looks, uh, it looks wrong and mm. it looks trivial mm. at a time when you know, we were all locked down when everybody was taking it so seriously. And as Cindy says, the juxtaposition yeah. with the number 10 parties makes it even worse. Uh, Cindy, you just mentioned uh, Partygate. And seems... senior civil servants, yes, Jackie senior mentioned senior civil too. servants, but it seems timely to, to bring up mm -hmm. the, the Times front page, which is uh, Sue Gray, who is the Partygate investigator, Investigator has been employed as Keir Starmer's chief of staff. Uh, their take on it, and a lot of Tories are up in arms about this mm. thing. It uh, sort of affects her credibility. What's your thoughts? I'm quite uncomfortable about it. Not because, as some Tories have said and some Boris Johnson allies have said, that she was always partisan throughout the Partygate investigation. I don't think we've seen evidence of that. It's a and stitch up from the left is what they're saying. <laughs> yeah, so, that, so that's the accusation from some people. And I, I, don't, I don't see evidence of that. And that's assuming that someone can't be completely professional when they're doing their current job, as if she was always a sleeper agent for the Labour Party. I mean, I find that a bit hard she, to believe. She wasn't wheeling the suitcases of booze into number <laughs> 10, did she? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And there's a no smoke without a fire. And the Boris Boris Johnson fire was pretty large um, without any help from Sue Gray. But I am un uncomfortable about it because she was the director of the Ethics and Propriety Office from 2012 to 2018 throughout a Conservative government. Now, you're telling me that once she goes into a partisan role, she's not going to use what she knows. I mean, on paper, you're not meant to. But really, when we're talking about fighting an election, I am sceptical mm. that, that once she that takes that role... Senior, every senior civil servant that's worked impartially under one exactly. government then can't work for another government? I think there government? needs to be some kind of time period. Now, right. now the government's own propriety office says that it might be six months mm -hmm. to, to put that kind of buffer zone in there, but six months will still be before the next election. And mm -hmm. I don't think six months changes anything materially about the political landscape when we're going up to, a, to an election. So I, I think that's not a long enough period. Um, and some people have suggested her going in after the election, mm. which is, I'm more comfortable with that. Look, I mean, Sue Gray was doing that propriety and ethics role when I was in government, when there was a Labour government, it never crossed my mind when it went from being a Labour government to a, to a coalition government in 2010 that she wouldn't carry on doing a senior role for a different political party 
in the civil service. So there was now, nothing course, in her behaviour that indicated she was a <laughs> spy for the left. That, no, there was, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, there was everything in her behaviour that suggested she was, and, and in fact in her professional record, that suggests she's an enormously professional and impartial. capable mm. and impartial So will Sakir servant. be a little disappointed to hear that? Was he hoping I've <laughs> well, got somebody on side who maybe has a little insight? No, 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 she's... What? Sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, this is the other thing. I mean, why else would he w want her on side? Well, because she's she... an efficient operator. No, no, well, of course, but she has, throughout okay. her entire career, been in the civil service. Yeah. Except for a career break where she ran a pub in Northern Ireland, which is fantastic, by the way. But she hasn't shown the kind of political nous you need to be a chief of staff role. So it is already an outside candidate. And it does raise questions of what it is that the Labour Party is hoping to get out of this. I'm not suggesting to conspiracy here, by the way, yeah. but they will be having to look, look at this in the round as well yeah. and thinking about what hopes we That's a really interesting point, because there are people in the Labour Party who are saying, oh, but surely what we need is a sort of political operator as Chief of Staff. I disagree. I mean, there are plenty of political operators around, right. rightly around Keir Starmer, but Keir Starmer wants to be the Prime Minister. Labour wants to form a government 13 years after it was last in government. Mm -hmm. It needs experienced people that understand government, right. that are trusted mm -hmm. by other civil servants. And there is, a, I suppose, well, there is a point about whether or not that, that trust mm. is more difficult now, given what she's done. But she completely gets government and it shows Labour preparing for government. She has an impressive mm -hmm. CV.